Good morning. Good morning. We're glad for each of you to be here for service this morning. Glad for a special time of service. No better way to, to start a Sunday morning worship service than to share with our brothers and sisters in Christ as they're baptized. And we have a couple this morning. For those of you that know them here a couple of weeks ago, Paige gave her life to the Lord. We're proud of her, proud of the decision she made. Today she's going to follow that through by following the Lord's example in baptism. By the power given unto me from our Lord Jesus Christ and his church, I baptize this, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Madison, she went with us to church camp, has been here several times before. Her her family's been coming since uh, she was at camp. And the first night of church camp, she made the decision to trust in Jesus as her Savior. She said she'd been dealing with it for some time, and we're so proud of her and glad to celebrate this occasion with her. Amen. By the power given to me by our Lord Jesus Christ and his church, we baptize this, our sister, in the name of the Father. Son and Holy Spirit. Let's stand this morning, if you would, please. We'll go ahead and get started. Brother Andy's getting ready in the back. How many is glad to be here this morning? Amen. Good way to start off the service. Thankful for all those that are here with us this morning and got to witness that. That's awesome right there. Amen. It don't get much better than that. It starts here and it flows over back there. So awesome way to start out the service. Thankful to be here this morning. Uh, before we sing, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. I think we should. Father, we just pause for a moment. God, as we approach your throne, we give you thanks, give you praise, give you honor and glory for another day that you've blessed us with. God, another opportunity we have to be back in your house. God, for the opportunity to witness the baptisms that we just saw. We're thankful for that this morning, thankful for the ones that came forth and decided to give their heart and soul to you. God, we're thankful for the ones that are here looking forward to what you have in store for us today. God, through the singing, through the word, through the fellowship, God, lifting up our brother to you this morning as he stands before us, that you just anoint him. Father, give him the words to speak. His words would be your words, and they'd find their way to us that are out in the audience. And lifting up those that will be singing this morning, the choirs they sing, those that are playing instruments, the sound uh, booth back there, Lord, everyone that has a part, including those in the pew that have planned for this week in prayer. God, may you just have your way with this service this morning. May you move amongst us. May your spirit move amongst us this morning. Now, God, I've mentioned it before, that old song, Shire us with your blessings. Thank you again for who you are, for what you've done for us, for what you're doing for us. And God, we're looking forward to what you're going to do for us in the near future. We give you praise and honor for it all. In your name we do pray. Amen. Amen. 219 in this little blue jewel this morning. 219. Turn around there and wave at somebody. Smile at them. Tell them you're glad to see them this morning. Be glad to be here. I have to tell you a little funny. I've uh, changed contacts. So I was up here leading the singing last Sunday and my contacts went blurry and I couldn't even see the words. So 
If y'all see me quit singing, <laughs> I can't see the words, and I don't want to mess up. But uh, anyways, this is an oldie but a goodie. Let's do the first, second, last stanzas, The Unclouded Day. They tell me of a home far beyond the sky. Oh, they tell me of a home far away. Oh, they tell me of a home where no storm clouds rise. Oh, they tell me of an unclouded day. Oh, the land of cloudless day. Oh, Sky. Oh, they tell me of a home where no storm clouds rise. Oh, they tell me of an unclouded day. Oh, they tell me of a home where my friends have gone. Oh, they tell me of that land far away where the tree of life in eternal bloom sheds its fragrance through the unclouded day. Oh, the land of cloudless day. Oh, the land of an unclouded sky. Oh, they tell me of a home where no storm clouds rise. Oh, they tell me of an unclouded day. They tell me that he smiles on his children there And his smile drives their sorrows all away And they tell me that no tears ever come again In that lovely land of unclouded day Oh, the land of cloudless day Oh Tell me of a home where no storm clouds rise. Oh, they tell me of an unclouded day. Thank you. You may be seated. If you have your Bibles, you can be going on and turning over to the book of Romans. Book of Romans in the eight chapters where we're going to be taking our scripture from here in a few moments. While you're turning there, it's been a good day, amen? I, I'll tell you, I, I never get tired of doing baptisms, and I don't, I don't think there's any better way to, to start a service, and I uh, appreciate both of those young ladies and the decisions they've made and, and the journey that they've embarked on. But, but you know, in times like this, whenever we make those decisions for Christ, when we get excited and get inspired by what God's doing. Satan doesn't, he's not satisfied with that, right? He, he isn't going to like it. He wants to do things to prevent that. And, and it's so often like that in life. Um, for, for those of us that have been, I guess, prevalent understanding of this technological age, there's a lot of frustrating things that come along with it. A lot of things that kind of get in the way. There's some good things, you know, I can remember, I can remember being in college and getting my first cell phone. It didn't look anything like this. And ne we never would have imagined what in the world that would have turned out to be, what that we would have basically. Th this phone right here has, I forget, it's five, ten times the memory of the first computer I ever had all inside of this little phone. And it's not even one of their, their top ones. But, but while all that technology can be so handy and so useful, and I, I use it on a daily basis with work and, and other things, and most of you all do as well, sometimes it can get frustrating. Probably each of you have experienced similar thing that I have. Phone systems have done some updating to help us a little bit, but how many of you have ever got a spam call? <laughs> Not not enjoyable, is it? I, I, I don't know. You look through my history, and you'll see one or two every day. 
Drew, we got him a phone here not long ago, him and, and Caleb both, and they apparently, <laughs> Drew was the unfortunate one that apparently got somebody's number that was one of those people that signed up for everything. I mean, they must have put their number in every website, on every folder, everything you signed, to get a free t-shirt, all those things. He gets calls constantly on his phone. He's like, that's just another spam call. But it, it, the, the nice thing is, my phone at least, and probably yours as well, it throws up this thing that says potential spam across the front of it. Well, if it says potential spam, guess what happens? Silence, hit the power button, send that thing to voicemail, don't answer it. And, and that's nice. I, I do like that it does that now because it, in my line of work, if I get a number that's a national number or anything in Middle Tennessee, I have to answer it. I, I can't just let that pass. That could be a client. That could be a potential sale. It could be something like that. So I can't just ignore it. And I don't know how many times over the years you get those calls and you're so frustrated. And I don't want to be rude to the person. I know they've got a job to do, but I've got a job to do, and I really don't want to talk to them. Oh, it's frustrating. Each of you know what I'm talking about. Well, in our spiritual journey, much like our physical journey here on this life, in our spiritual journey, what I'm talking about this morning, the good stuff in life, those things that we cling to, those things that we find strength and hope and peace in, Satan wants to disrupt those things. He, he wants to, to, to prevent that from being our focus. He throws potential spam at us all the time, and, and he wants us to bite. He wants us to answer the call, to get distracted, to allow our focus to change off of the one who has brought us this great hope. And, and that's really what Paul's talking about here in, Ro in Romans chapter 8. I, I'm going to start, and we're just going to start by reading specifically the first or the, verse number 5. We're going to read verse number 5 to start. It says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. So the first thing that we, we see in the, the message this morning, in the Scripture this morning as we look at it, is we want to take note of the distraction. There, it tells us here that there's a, a, a distraction that we need to be pre, we need to make a mental note of so that we can deal with it. And what it's talking about specifically is kind of this internal battle that each one of us face. Now listen, no one's immune to it. Just because I'm a preacher doesn't mean that it's any different for me than it is for you or, or anybody else in here. It doesn't matter how long we've been a Christian or if we've really even never taken that step. We each have this internal struggle that we have to face, that we have to battle. And, and it's kind of in, in more modern day, we, we, we look at it kind of like, what's our worldview? That's a common phrase. Do we have a secular worldview or do we have a biblical or a Christian worldview? How do we view things? And sometimes, let's be real, that's a struggle for each of us. Even for a mature Christian, sometimes it's easy to get wrapped up in politics and possessions and all these things and allow that to become our focus when in reality we should be keeping that biblical worldview instead of the secular worldview. Not worried about the material things, not worried about all the opinions of man, but worried about what Scripture tells us. Paul here, when he talks, he talks about that there's kind of two desires. The first one that he talks about is those that live according to the flesh, or this desire of the flesh. To the, to the church at Colossae, he explained it this way. He says, so put to death the sinful, earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Do not be greedy. For a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world because these sins, the anger of God is coming. It tells us that Satan, you know where he wants to attack us? It's not in the things that we oftentimes see or that we think of. Where he really wants to attack us is in our mind. That's what he wants to do. He wants to get into our mind. He wants our focus and our desire to be on the temporary things of life. 
And if he can get us focusing on the temporary, those fleshly things of life, then you know what happens? The eternal focus gets pushed to the back burner. As long as we're focused on the temporal, the eternal is not the focus. It tells us, though, in that passage, it says, those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. Let me ask it to you, kind of the, the phrase in reverse. Are you worried about worldly things? If you are, if you're worried, if your focus is on worldly things, that means you're, you're living like the world. That's what he's saying here. He says, that's what, that's what happens. On the flip side of that, he tells us that there's a different side, the contrast, not the desires of the flesh, but the desires of our Heavenly Father. The desires of the Father, it says, says, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. The, the same passage where I told you those things that Paul warned them in Colossae of, he also goes on in that passage and he says, Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourself with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, making allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. He tells us he wants us to have this, this, this spiritual outlook on life this have the desires that God gives us and, and it, we can only do that when we're led by the Spirit of God when we're led by the Spirit of God we'll see that we will live like Christ it says that we show some things it says we show tender-hearted mercy we show kindness we show humility we show gentleness and peace are those things that would describe the way that you carry yourselves I'm not always like that. I'm guilty of failing in some of those areas. That's just the truth. Sometimes I get frustrated, and sometimes I get angry, and sometimes I have a bit of a temper. I don't like that. I'm not proud of it. I'm not saying that's something that's okay. That's not what, what Christ did. The only times we see Christ get angry is he's angry at sin that's taking place. He's not angry at, at other people. He's angry at their sin. Here it tells us that we have some, some ways that we need to maybe adjust our living. It says that really that we need to prepare for people to make mistakes. Guess what? People's going to make mistakes, and so are you. Might as well get used to it. We all say, why well, I'm only human, and, and we want others to accept that of us when we mess up, but do we do that for other people? And then it takes it one step further in that passage, and he goes into some detail about it, and that is he tells us that we have to forgive everyone. Don't just forgive the people that's good to you. Listen to this. Don't even just forgive the people that ask for it. We have to forgive the people that, that don't ask for it, that don't deserve it. How do you know all this, Brother Andy? Because what does the Scripture say? It says you didn't deserve it, but he forgave you. He gives us that hope. It says that God also forgave you. I'm going to tell you folks, we can't live like Christ and hold hatred in our part for other people. You want to know what holds a lot of the church back? Church people back? You wonder why people don't want to listen to your testimony? Because you've got unforgiveness in your heart. It's a big deal, folks. It's a big deal. People won't let go of the past. And, and let me just be as plain and simple spoken with you as I can. You know what Jesus says? If you can't forgive someone else, then God won't forgive you. That's the truth, folks. If, if you are unwilling to forgive other people, you're going to have gate problems. That's just the truth. It's not easy. Most of y'all know what my childhood was like. I grew up in, in, in an abusive situation. It isn't easy to forgive people that don't deserve it, that don't ask for it, that don't come sorrowful. But you've got to because you know what your unforgiveness will do? It'll eat at you. It isn't going to affect them. It's going to eat at you, and it can cost you your relationship with God. He tells us that he wants to distract us. It goes on and explains this danger of it. 
I'm not being dramatic. It tells us, look at verse 6. It says, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. It tells us first of the distraction, now we see the danger. It tells us of this danger. It's a really bold statement, the first half of verse 6. It says, for to be carnally minded is what? Death. Death. It doesn't say it's disappointment. It doesn't say it's distracting. It doesn't say it's frustrating. It says to, to have a worldly mindset is death. It's, it's a, let's say, a bold statement. It's not talking about just physical death. The Scripture tells us that each one of us is appointed to, wants to die, right? Each one of us is going to taste death. Why are we doing that? Because sin entered the world. We know that. But that's not God's eternal desire for us. His desire is for us to spend an eternity with Him. He's got a place reserved for us. Got our name tag on the door. He's ready for us to receive it. That's, that's what the Scripture tells us. But... We can't do that and live like the world. We can't do that and be of the world. It tells us that it's not only just a physical death, but it's a separation from God. It says that to be carnally minded is death. And it goes on in verse 7, it says, To be carnally minded is enmity against God. It's hostility to God. It's showing hatred to God. It works against the will of God. You might say, well, it's okay. I can go to church. And I can pray, I pray at night, or I pray whenever we have our meals. I do those things. But it's okay to go out and live like the world the rest of the time. God knows. God knows. Let me be honest with you and straight with you again. God knows. God knows. You're exactly right. He knows. He knows that if if Satan allows us to, we can even deceive ourselves. The the Scripture makes it real plain that we cannot have two bosses. We can't do it. We, we We can't work for one person and the other person at the same time. Imagine if you have an, a full-time employer... And you go to them and say, I'm going to get a second job. And some places, they, they make you go and get approval for that, and you work after hours. And you say, no, 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 no. I'm going to have this second job, and I'm going to work it in at the exact same time I'm working at your job. That don't make any sense. They're going to say, no, you can go take that other one. I'm not paying you to do half the work. Here in the Scripture, it tells us that we, we can't have two bosses. We can't live in the flesh and live in faith at the same time. It says, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Really straight statement. Final thing that it tells us about. It told us of this distraction. It tells us of the danger. The final thing that it tells us of is the deliverance. The, see, the second half of 6 is, is so beautiful. It starts off and it says, To be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Jump on down and it, and it continues on it some more in verse 14. It actually tells us more in, in, and you can read what's in the middle a little later. But verses 14 and 15 says, For as many... As are led by the Spirit, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. In this final part, it tells us of this deliverance. You you know, whenever you get those spam calls, here's, here's what they tell us anyway. I don't know that it's always true, but I have a pretty good idea that it is. If, if you answer those spam calls, guess what's going to happen? You're going to get more of them. They're going to know, oh, this person's willing to answer, so we're going to keep lighting them up. Same way on our emails and everything else. Satan is the same way. 
you start to give in to a little bit, he's not going to stop. He's going to keep piling on. But it tells us it doesn't matter how deep we've got into this lifestyle that there is hope that there is a source of rescue, that there is something better than what we experience in this world and the, the constraints and the frustrations that go along with it. It says, for those who live according to the Spirit, but to those who are spiritually minded is life and peace. How many times in, 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 in our current day and age do we hear people struggling with finding peace? There's so many. We, we live in a time where it feels like there is no peace. I can remember back as a kid, y'all remember they used to have all the beauty pageants on television and stuff. One of the things they'd ask for, if you could have any wish, what would they always say? World peace. That's what they wanted, right? Listen, we live in a time where there is no peace whatsoever, it seems like, so often. You know why there's no peace? Because we're looking for peace in all the wrong places. We think we can find it in a government or in a military or in a financial institution or in our own pocketbooks. Guess what? Now those places you're going to find peace. What you're going to find is more and more frustration, more and more headaches, more and more problems. It tells us to be spiritually minded. When we truly get into that relationship with God, then we can find peace and we can have life. And it goes on and it tells us, that as many as are led by the Spirit of God, first of all, it tells us who leads us, right? We have to be led by the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit is one of those things that sometimes us Baptists, we get a little nervous talking about. We, we think, oh, that's them other people. Now it's not. The Holy Spirit is for everybody, and, and it don't always, sometimes people misunderstand what it is, but it tells us, it should be what leads us in this life. And it tells us that if it leads us, that it's a requirement. Listen to this. It's a requirement, not a request for the child of God. If you're a, if you're a child of God, then it's a requirement, not a request, that the Spirit of God be what leads us. It says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are... The sons of God. It goes on, it says, For you do not receive a spirit of bondage again to fear. It tells us in this deliverance, it gives us two gifts. Notice them real quick. The first gift is the gift of freedom. Some people think following God is some form of, some form of spiritual slavery. Like it's this burden he puts on us. Let me tell you. For those of us that's experienced it, for both of these young ladies, we just had this discussion within the last few weeks. When you experience the forgiveness of God, oh, it's not a burden. <laughs> it's not a burden, amen. It's a, a burden lifter. It's a load lightener. It's freedom that you've never experienced. It's no longer carrying the baggage that we've been piling on ourselves for all these years. It's just the opposite. It's a privilege that we get to serve God. It's not a punishment that we have to serve God. It's a privilege. And whenever we have experienced that freedom that comes only through the Son of God, then you know what I'm talking about. Here it tells us, that we're not, we're not, we didn't receive some spirit of bondage. It tells us that we got another gift too. Not just the gift of freedom, but this one's even better. The gift of family. See, not only are we given the release from sin, it tells us that we're also given this adoption. We're brought in to the family, to the household of God. It says, we have received the spirit of adoption of whom we cry out, Abba, Father. When we're adopted in the family of God, first thing you know what it's talking about in, in like a legal sense here, it tells us that we are given a legal inheritance. When we're brought into his family, we, we receive the same inheritance that all the others do. That place that's set aside for Moses and Abraham and Isaac and 
Peter and John and Paul and all those, guess what? You're part of that. You're on that same list. You're, uh, you receive an inheritance just like they do. Not only that, it tells us that we become part of the family. We're not just outsiders. We're not just that person waiting to receive our gift at the end. We're hoping that Ed McMahon's going to show up with some sweet sweepstakes check. It's not just that. We become part of it. We're brought into that family. And even now, that because we're part of it, we have that father we can lean on. We have a father that we can cry out to. It says that we have received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. I I want you to know, folks, there's there's no, no greater hope that we can probably find than to know right now that we have a father that we can cry out to. This morning, actually, Julie and I had talked about it and I didn't say anything to her about the message. I thought she was going to sing Good, Good Father. And she, she changed, and that's okay. But I love that song. It, it talks about how good our God is. And, and that's what the Scripture tells us, that we have a God that we can call out to. But you know what? That's what we have to do. Each one of us have that opportunity But we have to make that decision for ourselves. It's not something that anybody else can do. It can't be our parent. It can't be our friend. It can't be our spouse. It can't be our child. No one else can make that decision but you. You can leave here today the same way you came in. You can walk out and the spam of this world, Satan can keep throwing it at you. I'm not even talking about the stuff that's good enough to eat that's in the can. I'm talking about this worthless stuff, right? This stuff that we don't need that is just a distraction and it brings danger. Or today you can come to a place of deliverance. Would you do that? Is the Holy Spirit trying to lead you right now? Is he trying to take you by the hand and say, you know what, it's time for you to make that decision? If he is, would you? As you rise to your feet, Matt's going to lead us in a song of invitation. If you have need to come today, if the Holy Spirit's speaking to you, would you respond as we sing? Aren't you thankful we have a God that we can go to for anything and and then no matter what it is when we go to him he already knows he already knows our need he just wants us to bring it to him the scripture tells us that that his load is that that his uh or (laughs) to cast our cares on him for he cares for us and that that his load is is light that he doesn't have a heavy burden for us we just have to be able to carry the cross he puts before us. I hope today, if, if today if the Lord has spoke to you, I hope that you, you still come, find somebody to talk to. Maybe you got questions, you just got concerns, things you're dealing with. You don't have to leave out of here. Come up, find me, find somebody else, and just tell them you might need to pray or you might need to talk. Again, so glad you made the decision to be here with us. If you're watching online, thank you for joining us on service online as well. And may God bless you this week.